Well, good morning, everybody. Go ahead and grab a copy of God's Word and join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 this morning as we continue in our series under construction. Now, by way of review, up to this point through chapter 6, Paul has been primarily addressing concerns that uh, he'd been made aware of regarding the Corinthian church from the house of Chloe. A lot of those concerns revolved around pride, conflict, Christians taking each other to court, uh, incest in the church, even sexual immorality. But now here in chapter 7, Paul is shifting gears, and he's going to start addressing specific questions that the Corinthians wrote him about, questions about a personal liberty, a church structure, spiritual gifts, even doctrine. But here in chapter 7, Paul is going to address uh, some very sticky questions that the Corinthians asked regarding sex, separation, and singleness. And so over the next three weeks, we're going to be addressing each of these topics as Paul brings them up. And so the first topic that we're going to address this week is the Corinthians' sinful attitudes toward sex. We see that here in chapter 7, verse 1. It says this, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am. Now, to give you some context there, most theologians believe that Paul at one point in his life had been married. Uh, he'd been a member of the Sanhedrin, likely he had been a religious leader, and to be that, you had to be married according to Jewish custom. However, at this point of his life, we know that he is single and not ready to mingle. He is not wanting to get out there. He's happy, single, and wishing that others were. So it says in verse 7, I wish that all were as myself, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and to the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with sexual passion. So by way of introduction, what Paul is doing here is in chapter 6 and 7, he is addressing two sinful attitudes that are typical amongst God's people toward uh, the issue of sex. The first is the hedonistic view of sex. And that was uh, what Paul addressed in chapter 6. And the hedonistic view of sex was basically that sex is God. Uh, we worship sex. We find our identity in sex. We give ourselves to sex. Um, uh, the idea of hedonism is you do whatever your body commands because you're a slave to your desires. And I think we see in our context, in our culture, that um, our culture has basically given itself over to the hedonistic view of sex. Now, that's one ditch that uh, the Corinthians had fallen into, but some of the Corinthians had overreacted and fallen into another ditch, and that ditch is called asceticism. Now, that's not a word that we hear very much in our culture, but it basically meant this. Uh, sex is gross. Sex is icky, yucky, disgusting. Get as far away from it as you can, and the further away from it you are, the more holy you will be. And um, many in the Corinthian church were actually uh, saying to other people, um, because uh, sex is yucky, icky, and gross, never get married. And if you are married, get divorced so you're, you're not sexually tempted. And what Paul is going to write here in this text is this, and throughout all of his writings, um, sex is not God, sex is not gross, sex is a gift. Now, why are we talking about this today? Isn't, isn't sex uh, inappropriate to be having a, a conversation about in the church? Well, here's the thing. Um, Paul wrote about it under inspiration of the Holy Spirit to a group of people who were struggling with it. And I don't think that our churches are all that much different from the Corinthian church. 
many people are still struggling with this issue. But also keep in mind um, that God wrote a whole book about this called the Song of Solomon. And if God thinks it's important, if Paul thinks it's important, we better make sure that we are giving it its due importance in the church. I think because so many churches refuse to address this issue from the pulpit, in the vacuum and the silence of the church, the culture is getting all the influence in the minds of our young people. And I don't want that to be true of our church. So with great wisdom, with great restraint, I want to walk through this text, Lord willing, uh, by God's grace. So the primary question that Paul, uh, the people are asking Paul in this context is, isn't celibacy better? With all the messiness of sexuality in our culture and how abused it's been, isn't it better to just be celibate, never engage in the, in the activity? And Paul gives a very simple answer in the text. Celibacy is good. It is. But it's not good in marriage. Let's pray. Father, today we just ask and pray that you give us a great wisdom as we walk through the text, great clarity, great understanding. Uh, Father, would you bring conviction where necessary, encouragement where needed, healing where desperately wanted. And Father, I pray for some of our married couples uh, that they would be challenged uh, in this area of their life. For some of our singles, that they would be encouraged in, in, uh, in their walk of celibacy. Uh, in it all, Father, we pray that you will be glorified. We pray in the uh, wonderful name of the Lord Jesus, all God's people said. Amen. All right, so let's start here. Point number one is this. Uh, celibacy is a gift uh, to be celebrated. We find that in verses uh, one, and then we're going to jump down to verse six. It says, now concerning the matters about which I wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Verse six, now as a concession, not a command, I say, uh, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this today because um, we're actually going to dive into it very specifically in two weeks. Paul's going to give us his dude's manifesto on singleness and satisfaction. Uh, but what Paul is doing is he's asking a very simple question. Um, He's saying, is it good not to touch a woman? Is it good not to engage in sexual relations? Is it good to remain celibate if you can? And his very basic answer is yes. If, if you have the ability, in fact, if, if you have the ability to refrain from sexual uh, activity, if your desire is not very strong, and then verse 7, he says that um, that's a gift from God. I know that that might sound strange to some of us, but the reality is Jesus actually affirms this in Matthew chapter 19, verse 12. He says this, for there are eunuchs, listen to this, a, a eunuch is a person who's, who abstains uh, from sexual activity, whether by choice or, or not, um, but there are some eunuchs who have been so from birth. And that is that there are some people that are just not born with much of a sexual desire. Um, and that translates into just a low desire for marriage. Now he goes on, there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. So in other words, there were, there were people who um, just had no real sexual appetite since the day they were born. There were others who had been uh, made eunuchs by uh, slave owners. And then there were some who were eunuchs by choice for the sake of the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is saying here is this, he's basically affirming exactly what Paul is telling us here, is that if you are the type of person that does not have a strong sexual desire, and that translates into just, you don't have much of a desire to be married, that is not only, a, that is a gift from God. Because that means you're able to use your singleness, all of your energy, all of your time, all of your emotions, all of your energy for the service of the kingdom of God in a way that married people cannot do that. And so what I want to tell you is this, if, if you're here this morning and, 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 and you've kind of always wondered like, is there something wrong with me that I don't really have a desire for marriage or I don't really have a strong sexual desire? What does that mean for me? A couple of things. Um, it means you're not broken. It means you're not weird. 
It means you're not half a Christian. Um, it, it means that you're not less valuable than married people in the kingdom of God. If, if you've been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins, and you have no desire for marriage, you have no a sexual appetite, then that means that you have been freed to give your life to the kingdom of God. And that is a tremendous gift that we as a church should be able to celebrate with you. Now, how do you know if you have that gift? Well, first, in verse 9, actually, Paul's pretty clear about it. It says this, but that if they cannot exercise self-control, then they should marry. Uh, so in other words, um, if you can't control yourself sexually, you don't have the gift. If you can't control your eyes, if you can't control your hands, if you can't control your sexual organs, if you can't control your mind or your heart, you don't have the gift. Get married. Okay? Well, then some people may ask, well, what if I'm an unwilling single? What if I want to be married, but it just hasn't happened? And honestly, that was my story for a long time. Um, I wasn't married, many of you might not know this, I wasn't married until I was 29. Um, I attended a, a Faith Baptist Bible College, also known as Faith Baptist Bridal College. And that's where many guys went to get their MDiv and many gals went to get their MRS degree. And, and that's just where everybody got married. And I remember going to Faith Baptist Bible College and Theological Seminary thinking, I'm going to meet my spouse here. And seven years passed and I watched friend after friend after friend. I was in wedding after wedding and after wedding and it was never my time. And I remember uh, moving out to Gallup Police, Ohio, a small, tiny little town of 4,000 people, thinking to myself as I'm driving, making the 12-hour trip from Iowa to Ohio, thinking to myself, God has called me to a life of celibacy. I've not met my spouse. I'm not going to meet my spouse in a tiny little town of 4,000 people. I guess I'm called to be single. And that was very hard for me. But I think during that season of my life, God was teaching me some very important things. I think He spared me from a couple of really bad relationships that would have turned out not good. But I also think during that time, God was teaching me how as a single to pour all of my energy and all of my focus and all of my attention into serving Him. And if that's you, if you're an unwilling single, I cannot encourage you enough. Paul's going to talk about it later half of chapter 7. You have the ability, you have the privilege without the attachments of family and children and planning for your future and how to provide for these, uh, all of these other people. I've got five women at home that I've got I've to serve and I've got to constantly think about and I praise God for that opportunity, but pray for a brother because there's a lot of responsibility in that. But when I was single, I didn't have to think of any of that. I could just give all of my attention to uh, the Lord and serving Him fully. And what I'm telling you is this, you've been given a gift for a season. If you get after focusing on what God cares about most in due time, God will honor your desire. So quit focusing on finding the perfect person and focus on serving the Lord. As Jesus said, there were many eunuchs who chose to be eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. During this season, give yourself fully to the kingdom of God and God in due time will honor your desire. Celibacy is a gift and it's a gift to be celebrated. Point number two, celibacy within marriage makes us incredibly vulnerable to sexual immorality. Paul says this in verse two. He says, but because of temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. Now, marriage holds many purposes for us. Here are just a few that I wrote down. Marriage serves the purpose of procreation. Genesis 1.28, be fruitful, multiply. Uh, marriage also serves the purpose of pleasure. Uh, Proverbs chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, Solomon says, Drink deeply from your own cisterns, from your own wells. It's for pleasure. Uh, marriage also serves the purpose of companionship. Uh, God said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, It's not good for a man to be alone. It also serves as a picture of Christ's love for His church, as we see in Ephesians chapter 5. But it also serves for the preservation of purity in the life of of the child of God. As we see here in the text, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, Paul says, guys, find a woman, find a wife, 
What, uh, girls, find a husband. This is what will help you stay pure and holy in this life. To be able to enjoy sexual activity in the confines of the marriage covenant is the one place in which God has ordained for us to have that as an outlet. And so what we need to do is we need to remember Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. The writer there says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulter the adulteress. What Paul and what the writer of Hebrews are telling us here is that the marriage bed and marriage itself is like a dam, okay? And it holds back the flood that would come to sweep us away into the swamp of sexual immorality and adultery. And make no mistake about it, we live in a culture that is being flooded, inundated with temptation towards sexual immorality everywhere we go. Just some stats to help you understand that. In America, the average American watches four hours of visual media a day. In primetime television, 77% of primetime television it ha contains sexual content. There's an average of five sexual moments per hour in primetime television. Of the top 10 TV shows in primetime, there are 6.7 sexual moments an hour. Just think about this last weekend, Fifty Shades Darker came out. This is a movie that's been panned by audiences and critics alike. It's got a nine on Rotten Tomatoes, and yet it's made 40 seven million dollars in a single weekend. Why? Because our culture is being flooded with sexual immorality. And it's not only sweeping through secular culture, it's sweeping and flooding into the church because uh, marriage covenants and marriage beds have broken down and fallen apart and people are caving to this temptation because we have forgotten that marriage is intended to preserve our purity. Now, let's kind of pull back here just for a second. What was the problem in Corinth? Well, just by way of reminder so that we remember what the problem in Corinth was, um, many of the people in Corinth had come to Christ out of a very hedonistic culture, much like ours. Um, but in an overreaction to hedonism, they had jumped headlong into asceticism. And so for many of those who were in marriages, had committed to an ascetic life and committed to celibacy even in marriage. And for many of them, that was not a mutual decision. That was a unilateral decision made by one person. They were robbing the other person of their conjugal rights. And in so doing, they were tempting their spouse into sexual immorality. And we need to understand, you need to understand, if you live in a marriage where there is prolonged indefinite okay, celibacy, you will put your spouse in a position where they will be tempted by Satan to sexual immorality. You just need to know that you are setting yourself and your spouse up for that temptation. Prolonged celibacy in a marriage will make you susceptible to the lie of Satan that it is not wrong to satisfy your sexual desires through fornication, through adultery, through self-gratification. You are setting yourself up to be tempted by Satan. And here's what you need to know about what Satan's going to do. Okay? Think, of, think of sex like a pearl. Within its proper context, it's, it's beautiful. It will grow. It will flourish. It will uh, grow strong and beautiful and priceless. But you need to know that there is a thief who is going to do everything within his power to pry open that clamshell to get that pearl out of there so that he can destroy its value. And so for singles, you need to understand that Satan's going to do everything within his power to pry open that pearl before it matures. For marrieds, you need to understand that Satan's going to do everything within his power to pry open that pearl and cast that pearl before the swine of fornication, before adultery, before self-gratification, and ruin the gift that God has given to you. The marriage bed is a dam. It is to hold back the flood of sexual immorality that our culture is throwing at us everywhere we go. And if we do not remember 
that marriage holds many purposes. Marriage has many reasons. It's more than just the five that I mentioned. But if we forget that the marriage bed is designed to preserve the purity of the child of God, then we are setting ourselves up to lose in the battle against temptation sent by Satan himself. Look, celibacy is not good in a marriage because it sets us up for tremendous temptation to sexual immorality. That's point number two. Point number three is this. Celibacy in marriage actually robs your spouse of their marital rights. It says this in verses three through five. Paul writes, the husband should give his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. And just pause, that would have been revolutionary um, for a Corinthian woman to hear that she actually holds equal rights over her husband's body. In, in a very masculine culture, that was revolutionary in Paul's writing. I just don't want to miss that. Verse 5, it says, Then do not deprive one another, except perhaps by arrangement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of of self-control. So let's go back to this idea of authority in verses three and four. What does it mean um, to have authority over another person's body, especially if they're your spouse? Let's start here. If you are a blood-bought, born-again believer in Jesus Christ, if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins. You have been born again. You have been regenerated. You have become a child of God. You're adopted into the family. All of these great things. Okay, if that is you, then here's what you need to know. Your body is not your own. Your body does not belong to you. Now, I know that that's a radical concept in our Americanized culture where we kind of have this philosophy of like, nobody owns me. Nobody, I'm autonomous. I'm my own person and um, I don't even belong to anybody else. Well, actually, just back up to uh, chapter 6, verse 19, a couple of verses earlier. Uh, Paul says this, or do you not know? These are things that the Corinthians should have known and we should know this too. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. In other words, if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, and you have been purchased from the slave block of sin by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, you are not your own. Your body is not your own. It belongs to God. The reason why you seek to honor God with your body is because it doesn't belong to you. When somebody throws you the keys to their car, you better take good care of it because it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to another. You're going to give an account for how you used it. Similarly, with your body, when you stand before the Lord, you will give an account for how you used it. Conversely, if you are married, your body does not belong to you. It belongs as well to your spouse. The day that you pledge yourself to your spouse, the day that you said, I do, in sickness and in health, for better or worse, for richer or poorer, till death do us part, I pledge myself to you. When you did that, you sacrificed your autonomy and you submitted yourself, your person, your body to the service of another in this life, that in the joining of your bodies, two would become one. That is the mystery of marriage, the beauty of two becoming one, that you would give yourself in submission to another for the service of their needs. And so, here's what that means. Um, sex isn't for you. Sex is not for you. And that goes against everything in our American culture that tells us right now that sex is for you, that sex is about serving your needs and your desires and your appetites whenever and however you want them. But what God tells us 
in his word is that sex is not for us. Actually, it's about serving the needs of the person that you married. You do not exist to serve yourself in your own needs. You exist to serve the needs of another. The problem with celibacy in marriage is typically celibacy is a unilateral decision made by one person without the consent of another. And when that happens, not only is the person who made that choice putting the other person in danger of temptation from Satan, but they are also robbing the rights that you gave to that spouse on the day you were married. You pledged yourself and then in unilaterally choosing to withhold, you are robbing your spouse of that which you pledged to them. Now, Paul does say here in the text that there's actually one legitimate reason why um, we would actually want to um, engage in a season of celibacy within marriage. And it says here in verse 5, do not deprive one another, there's the command, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Maybe you're going through a, a, a crisis in life. Uh, maybe it's a health crisis, a medical crisis, or a relational crisis, a financial crisis, a spiritual crisis, whatever your crisis is. And in that season of your life, as a married couple, you decide we need to uh, give all of our attention, all of our energy, all of our focus and time toward praying that God would move in the midst of our crisis. Uh, that is a very biblical, God-honoring reason to choose celibacy for a predetermined amount of time. But notice what Paul says here in the text. Except perhaps by agreement for a limited time. That is not indefinite. That is not permanent. That is for a limited time that is based on agreement, but then come back together again. Why? So that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of of self-control. What are you saying is this, if you choose to do that, it has to be intentional, it has to be for a predetermined amount of time, because during that time, your desire and your appetite will grow, and if you don't return to one another, Satan can come in and use that desire against you and tempt you to sexual immorality. So the bottom line is this, verse 5, um, don't deprive each other. Don't deprive each other. Married couples, um, do not rob your spouse of their marital rights, which you gave them on the day of your wedding. And two, um, do not rob them and put them in a position where they will be tempted by Satan to sexual immorality. Now, let me say this as a caveat so that we're clear and we're cautious because my concern um, we have to remember that 1 Corinthians is a corrective letter. Um, Paul is preaching to people who are living in a ditch. These are not balanced people. He's preaching to people who are way off center and is trying to pull them back to center. But if we don't remember that this is a corrective letter, we will misinterpret this. And what may happen for some of you is that you will go home and you will use these verses as a bully stick to make your spouse do what you want them to do, when you want them to do it, however you want them to do it. And what I'm telling you is this, that is not the intention of these verses. That is not the balance and Paul's or God's intention for you to go home and bully your spouse into doing what you want to satisfy your own selfish desires. The balance is love. The balance is love. And here's the balance. Here's the balance. Do not demand and do not deprive. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verse 5, love does not demand its own way. If you go home and start demanding your own rights and demanding how things are going to be done and when things are going to be done, and um, you are not loving your spouse, you are loving you. Shame on you. Shame on you. Don't ever be demanding in that fashion. At the same time, love does not deprive. If you are withholding or holding back for whatever purposes, you are loving yourself. You are loving yourself um, and not loving your spouse. 
Do not demand. Do not deprive. Love is the key to understanding the balance of both. Now, what is sad is that so often celibacy in Christian marriages is not the result of prayer, if ever. And what is sad is that oftentimes celibacy is is a result of a myriad of other things. And here are just a few that I wrote down. Now, sometimes uh, celibacy within the context of a Christian marriage is the result of dysfunction. And that's not the fault of either party. Um, Something physical or physiological has gotten in the way. And the good thing is, a lot of times you can get medical help for that. And if that's you, you're in that situation, get the help that you need. But sometimes celibacy is also a result of of false guilt. Um, A lot of people have a really messed up um, history and and bad past, um, and that gets carried into uh, their marriage and causes guilt and can sometimes create uh, an unwillingness to engage and can cause a celibacy. And what Paul tells us in chapter 6, verse 11 is, look, there were a lot of people coming out of a messed up sexual past. But he said, look, that's not who you are anymore. Such were some of you. You were washed of that past. You were sanctified and set a part of it. And even if it was your fault, you've been justified and declared declared not guilty of your past. You are now free in Christ. That's not who you are anymore. And even if you committed some of these sins since you came to Christ, uh, Jesus reminds us, um, John reminds us, that God is just to forgive us our sins when we seek forgiveness. Look, that's not who you are. Your past doesn't have to define you. Guilt doesn't have to define you. Be released from that. Uh, Another reason oftentimes why um, there's celibacy in a marriage is because um, one spouse feels judged by another. In other words, they don't feel good enough uh, because of their appearance or maybe their performance. And uh, just what we need to know is this. Look, if, if you're the spouse that has created that environment where your spouse um, never feels good enough, um, that's probably because you are treating your spouse like an object rather than your spouse. Um, you're treating them like an object. And in treating them like an object, you're comparing them to everything else. And look, if you're trying to compare them to everything the world has to offer, your spouse is never ever going to be good enough. And what you need to do, if that is the environment you have created, is to repent. You say, honey, I love you for who you are, not who I wish you were. And I don't wish that you were anything else. I love you for who you are right now. Every nook, every cranny, every curve, every crevice, everything that you are, I love you for you. And regardless of what you do or don't do or how you look or don't look, I love you for who you are. And that will begin the healing process in that context. But also sometimes um, what can create celibacy in a marriage is control and manipulation. Oftentimes in marriages, and this is common, sex is used as a weapon. And sex is used in a way to manipulate or control your spouse into making a decision or doing a thing or becoming a person that you want them to be. And ultimately, when you use sex in that fashion, you are playing the role of God. You're trying to control and and manipulate your spouse into becoming the person you want to be. And if that is you, you need to repent as well. You need to step back and say, I am not God. I'm not going to use what God has given to us as a gift to control or to manipulate my spouse. Repent of that. Another reason that can cause uh, celibacy in a marriage is unforgiveness. When there is unforgiveness uh, between uh, a couple, especially when the spouse has sought forgiveness and one refuses to give it, um, that will create um, a sense of celibacy in the marriage. And here's another one. Uh, And what do you do in that context? You've got to forgive. There are no enduring relationships without forgiveness, and there's no enduring marriage without it either. So another reason why um, celibacy may develop in a marriage is because you develop a crutch. Um, One spouse may develop uh, or have a a higher need of frequency than the other, and um, because of that higher need, 
Um, they develop a crutch because they're not being, their needs are not being met and they develop a crutch through pornography and self-gratification and whatever it may be or a fantasy life. And, and look, if that's you and you've created a crutch, that is driving a wedge between you and your spouse. And you are creating a perfect fertile ground for Satan to come in and tempt you and destroy your marriage. So look, um, look at what it says in the text. Verse 5. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement of a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, that you may not be tempted because by Satan because of your lack of self-control. Look, no crutches, um, no celibacy in marriage. Do not deprive and do not demand. Couples, we are called to this for a purpose. Celibacy is good. It's not good in a marriage. So a couple of thoughts as we close this out today. Um, thought number one, singles. Um, if you've been called to singleness, if you have the gift of singleness, praise God. Celebrate the gift that you've been given and use it for the sake of the kingdom. You're not half a person. You're not less valuable than married people. God has given you a gift. Use it. Or for those who are single, and maybe that's not where they want to be, um, Use what you have. Use the this sing- this season of singleness for the glory of God now. now. For those who are married, look, no celibacy in your marriage. Um, don't, no withholding, no manipulating, no crutches, no celibacy, period. Which means uh, some of you may need to go home and have a conversation. Some of you may need to go home and talk about, hey, these are my needs. These are my expectations. These are my unmet desires. This is what I need. And just have a conversation. Um, If you don't know how to have that conversation, meet with your pastors. This shouldn't feel weird. Let us not treat as gross what God has given to us as a gift. Okay? We are here to help. Um, Get accountability uh, from your small group so that you're not depending on a crutch uh, if you have one. In all of this, though, remember, celibacy is good, but it's not good in a marriage. Next week, we're going to be looking at the next uh, about 14 verses, verses 10 through 24. And uh, we're going to be talking about a much easier topic, I praise God for, separation and divorce. And um, so that's going to be a a much easier topic than this was. Um, But please uh, be in prayer for that as we talk about it. It It's a very serious topic and one that hits a lot of people. Uh, in a very sensitive place. And so, um, church, let's close uh, in prayer. Let's ask the Lord to bless as we go home and consider these things. Father, we do ask and pray, God, that you would work in the marriages of of the people of our church, and maybe even those who are listening online. We pray, God, that, um, Lord, praise you that celibacy is a good thing, uh, but it's not good in a marriage. And so we pray, God, for many um, who have been living in that kind of a marriage for quite a while. We pray, God, Um, The couples would go home today and have a healthy conversation about uh, their needs and how they can uh, please one another and ultimately please you. We pray this all in Jesus' name.